Well, growing up in England uh, in the 50s and 60s was very, very difficult for children of dual heritage. Um, there was a lot of direct racism. People didn't hide how they felt. Um, you would be called Sambo and nigger on the way to school. Uh, we used to be attacked every single day on our way from school. Interestingly, I guess most of the kids at that time were more interested in getting to school on time because there were strict penalties. You, you would be held back at the end of the day. Um, but on the way home, uh, we used to find ourselves cowering on bomb, bomb sites which were left over from the Second World War and people, uh, other children, throwing house bricks at us and uh, doing anything to attack us and hit us, hitting us with sticks. Um, at that time, my father used to uh, insist that my brothers were responsible to make sure that I was safe. And I really did feel that. My brothers would stand in front of me when the missiles were being thrown. And um, they lived quite a tough life in those days because uh, it was a time when there were notices uh, on uh, guest houses and boarding houses that would say, uh, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. And even as a child, um, I could go past a, a local bar because there were bars on every corner of most streets. And that sign would be clearly displayed. And I remember asking my mum, what does this mean? You know, and she explained to me that some people are racist and they don't like black people but you have to stick your head up and be proud of who you are. And I love my mum for that. She really did support me in terms of the racism that we had to face, and so did my dad. So, yeah, we'd go backwards and forwards to school and be attacked. We had to sit in class and teachers would read stories about sambos and nigger boys, six little nigger boys. And um, it was so... Embarrassing, that's the word that I felt at the time. Um, so that was the, the racism about not being white and about being black. Uh, in my case as well, I would get people saying to me, just get rid of that hair. And I'd say, what do you mean? They'd say, well, nobody would know if you got rid of the hair. Um, so there was an issue about my hair. And I remember my mum getting me to have my hair straightened. And I hated it. I like my curly hair. I loved it. And consequently, I don't think I've ever had my hair straightened since. Something that happened, um, I think it was 1993, uh, when I actually had a dream. And it was such a vivid dream. I um, woke up uh, in a hot sweat and I recalled the dream. It was... Uh, shortly after my father died and in the dream there was an African dance going on and all I can say it was something that I did not recognize there was nothing in my world that could tell me what was this person or creature that was dancing in my dream and beckoning me to come uh, the figure was dressed in grasses and there was a lot of red cloth as well swinging and it was almost as though he was turning and turning and turning. I feel it was male, this figure, turning and turning and dancing and there was fire and there was a hand outstretched and he was drawing me in and calling me to come. I guess it meant a lot to me because there were no reference points. I'd never been to Nigeria. I, I didn't know hardly anything about it apart from the things that my father had shared about his culture, which he felt he had a duty to do uh, so that we would know something of who we were. But, you know, we didn't know, really. We didn't know what he meant. Uh, we couldn't actually picture, I couldn't picture what he, what he talked about often. Um, but... So I had this dream. I felt completely elated. It made me want to go. I felt my ancestors were calling me and I had to go. What did I do about it? I decided to track down my uncle 
who I knew lived in London and I managed to get his number and I called him. And I, I said to him that uh, I'd had a dream and I, I wanted to go to Nigeria. And he answered by saying, never, you will not go, you're English, you're not Nigerian. I said, I'm going. Six weeks later, I had organised myself enough to go. Eventually we crossed the bridge. Before we went to the family compound, because the uncle had not arrived yet, we went to visit um, some neighbours to my family. And they started pulling out photographs. And they pulled out a photograph of my great grandmother, amongst others. And I was absolutely stunned because I looked just like her. I, I was looking at myself at 60, 70 years old, tall, straight, gray hair, proud, strong. And it begged the question, where did I get my strength from? I'd always ask myself that question because my mom was so gentle and small. My mom was five foot four. This woman was a giant. And she looked like a warrior woman. And that's how I look. And there was my nemesis. She, this was me. This is my ancestor. This is my, my guide in life. And I knew that I was from her. the front page of the African Times. It was dated the 13th of May, 1888. And the headline said, Slavery Ends. And he said to me, read it. And I read. The storyline was about how my relatives, my great grandmother had fought strongly against slavery, that she had been taken as a slave to Brazil. And she caused so much trouble there and so much uprising there that they decided to send her back to Lagos Island. She was a returner. I was so proud of her. And she carried on her fight in whatever ways she possibly could. The 13th of May, 1888 has become a celebration day for me. Okay. Um, my great-grandmother did not want to lose her name as a slave. And when they returned her, she decided to retake her name, to take it back. What had happened originally is my family were taken as slaves from Benin. They were taken to Lagos Island. Some of them remained there. She worked in the markets there. She was the head of the market. She controlled all of that. Um, then she was shipped herself to Brazil. When she came back, she made a street sign uh, the family name was Bangboche, not Martinez, which is the Portuguese slave owners, not Martins, which is the British imperialist uh, anglicised version of the name, but Bangboche. And at that time they were denied the use of their own name. So she made a street sign and she put it up in the street and it's still there to this day. And the name of the street is Bangboche Street. She took her name back. Everybody in Lagos knows Bangboche Street. So now I know when I tell people, they say, oh, when I speak to Nigerians anyhow, they say, what is your family name? I say, my family name is Martins. Oh, which Martins? I say, Bangboche Martins. They say, ah, oh, Bangboche Martins. We know you people. You know, the family is well known for what they did. And I'm really proud of that. If I could share one nugget of wisdom with you about uh, what I've gained from my journey, it would be to 
embrace who you are, to hear the, the categories that people try and fit you into or the boxes that people try and fit you into, but to know that you don't have to fit into anybody's idea of who you are. In order to do that, though, uh, embracing who you are is also about accepting all sides of you, whether your mother is Irish, your father is Asian, Indian, it doesn't really matter where you come from. Know who you are and be proud of your heritage because that's something that you will be passing on and share your stories. <laughs>